Welcome to the Show Me Podcast with your host, Jeff Livingston. Every episode, a guest joins yeah, Jeff and discusses how images tell stories and what they can work. Or not <laughs> yeah. or your, or not your, but yeah. It's uh, this guy Carter recorded this. He did a great job. Trust me. All right. We're through that. And uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Dave Murphy. And uh, for those of you who do not know Dave, if you're a photography podcasting uh, or podophile, I don't, that's horrible sounding. Never mind that's, that. That's very... That's light. horrible sounding. Oh, man. That's Podcast uh, connoisseur. Yes. Then you would want to listen to uh, Around the Lens, which is in its... 174th or no uh, well we got 179 this coming Monday okay. uh, so I don't know when you plan to publish this but uh, yeah we're, we're almost at our four year mark so just shy of our four year mark so this is uh, actually going to publish next week so you okay, great. I, I dump uh, four episodes every month and I do it at once as a batch nice so we will be uh, coinciding with episode 179 awesome yeah and it's a great podcast it's a lot like around the horn on ESPN but That's it's right. kind of a little more uh, uh Shall we say substantive? <laughs> I, I think so. I try to make it substantive, you know? Yeah. Everything's focused on visual journalism. So, you know, there's a lot of great podcasts out there that have, you know, commentators. I like to kind of think, uh, you know, we model ourselves a little bit off of TWIP this week in photography where, you know, great host, great podcast, but it's more general photography related where I like to go a little bit more into the visual journalism side of things. You know, I have people who have been Pulitzer Prize winners, people who... Yeah, have, you got some great guests. I was listening to an episode yesterday. It's insane. Yeah, we, well, we had Iberian X uh, Perillo, a friend of the show, and, you know, of course, you know, we were at Focus on the Story. He was there. Yeah, you mentioned it, yeah. Uh, Candid Frame, great podcast, had me on his show last year, and he paid the favor back and was on my show uh, just last week. So, again, it's just amazing, you know, what you can do with the power of podcasting in terms of just connecting with people and having them... Uh, a great opportunity to just talk to them about things. I mean, you had Sharon Farmer on here. I listened to that episode. That was great. She was so awesome, man. She, she was a great person to meet with. I got to interview her at the Focus on the Story event. Such a kind, generous, and just exuberant individual. And I, I hope to be like her when I'm, uh, you know, in that stage of my career. So You know what's amazing about Sharon, and, and then we'll dive into the episode, is that uh, I actually had lunch with her. What you see on the stage, what you see or what you hear on the podcast is the exact same person that you get when you break bread with her. She is a dynamic, fun individual. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's not something she has to turn on. It's just always on, and I saw that when I did my interview with her, for sure. Sharon is Sharon. What, right. I, what I also loved about that episode, too, is when she critiqued the Obama White House, because mm-hmm. she, she basically, uh, in a very <clears throat> a veiled way, said that uh, Pete Souza kind of like dominated the White House and didn't let everybody have the shots. Right, right. It was pretty funny. Um, so, as you know, each episode, what we like to do is either feature uh, a famous photograph or a famous photographer starting with one of their famous photographs absolutely, and, and talk about them and why their stuff was successful and why they were influential and, and used to serve right in the military. I was in the Marine Corps for eight years and thank I you. currently, thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, and then I did the air national guard for a few years and now I'm actually currently an active duty air force, uh, public affairs officer. So. Okay. That's pretty awesome, man. Thank you. So the, the guy we're going to discuss today is uh, James Natchway. Is that correct? Yeah. James Natchway. Oops. Uh, pronounce it right. Livingston. No worries. No worries. Uh, you know, this guy has been, he's a legend in the career field, especially with photojournalism, been doing it for you know four decades, uh, mostly focusing on conflict photography, mm-hmm. wars, and just areas that have had, you know, you know, just areas with issues going on, um, human strife and whatnot. A lot of civil so, rights too, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think he. Uh, I was just recently uh, hearing about he was covering the opioid crisis and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So you know, he goes where there's you know human suffering, and it's just because he feels that it's important to shine a light on those areas. You know, because especially with like war photography, especially he feels that you know if you if you take a picture of war, you can't not. It's like. He's not trying to be anti-war, or at least maybe he's not expressly trying to do that. But in his work, it's it's focused on that because he's showing the hardship, you know, the realities of war. Right. And it's like you can't look at what like he's showing you with the death and destruction and be like, oh, I'm for that. You know, but he's again, he's doing great imagery, whatever he does. It, it's showcasing, you know, human suffering in such a way to force and, and make you think about it and hopefully, you know, try to prevent that from happening. You know, it's like. If you see what's really going on, you may not want to 
uh, have that go on again. So it's a very simple basis and kind of like what, you know, in the future, perhaps um, in my post military career, you know, I'll focus on doing, which is, you know, again, uh, doing photojournalism full time with uh, the aspect of being on, you know, human interest and um, trying to focus on areas that perhaps aren't getting enough light shown on them, but definitely need that sort of attention. Yeah. So Nakwe, is that right? Nakwe. Yeah. So when I looked at his work preparing for the show and, uh, you know, I'm a little bit of a, uh, less savvy, uh, historian of photography, but I've definitely, um, seen some stuff and I've definitely seen a lot of the world press photo exhibitions. So, uh, uh, when I started Googling him, and of course he was in there, he's been nominated numerous times for the World Press Photo Award and has placed several years, um, including this was, I think, uh, this is a photograph of a young man in Nicaragua, a soldier, uh, kind of posing with a gun, and a naked boy uh, comes underneath in between his legs, and it's just a shocking photo, right? Mm -hmm. It's just absolutely. absolutely shocking, shows the real impacts of war, and uh, I personally thought that it was um, uh, just remarkable. And a lot of his work is like this. This was in the 80s in Nicaragua. He's consistently been nominated. He's consistently done great work. And he shows like the, the subtlety of humanity. Like this kid, here's this like suave soldier again. And then here's this kid without pants just running around, right? You know? Yeah. And um, uh, what, what do you think is uh, so emotive about this photo? Well, I mean, it's just it shows what would normally be considered a a moment of life. You know, it's just for him, it's probably just in a, a, any other day, right? You know, mm -hmm. but for us as the viewer, this is like so foreign to what we think of as sort of just an everyday. You know, like there's a guy in a, a uniform. He's got a, a weapon. He's got his son who's you know looks like he's wearing you know his shirt is kind of uh, disheveled and sort of dirty, uh, and it's in a hut area or it's no just, light, you know, right? Yeah, there's no light. I mean, this is. This is the reality of his situation, and it's it's so foreign and different than, you know, I would say more Western societies in terms of what we're used to. You know, we wouldn't expect to see someone, you know, wearing, you know, camouflage, you know, uh, uniform and uh, having a weapon ready to go loaded uh, with ammunition in sort of our day-to-day -day life. So, again, it kind of pushes us and gives us that window on someone else's day-to-day -day life, and it's just uh, really, you know, I think powerful for that means. Right. One of the things I noticed with Nakwe stuff, like when I looked at some of the stuff that he was doing in India as well, uh, just looking at some of the impoverished life there, was, um, uh, and, and you kind of touched on it, was the, or his general ability to depict uh, sadness or strife or uh, perhaps difficulties right. is probably a better word because maybe some of these people aren't sad. It's just the reality, right? And, you know, sometimes they, may, they don't know what it is to be like, it's their norm. Yeah. Right? They don't live in Washington, D.C. or wherever. Right. right? <clears throat> this is this is their life and they may be completely satisfied with it. But but to the Western eye, so to mm -hmm. speak, it looks like, wow, almost atrocious. Yeah. But when he does it, it's not like these photographs, which, you know, I'm not saying these photographs are the, the typical uh, photograph that we think of with these situations. The, the war journalism photo where you see like blood and sure. stuff like that and people losing limbs and soldiers in the with their face strained he actually captures the the rhythm of the situation the real everyday happenstance if you would yeah it, it's you know when i was you know in the military especially in you know when you're in a sort of deployed environment or whatnot you know, it's it's not a war movie, right? It's not things happening every minute of every day all the time. You know, there's a lot of waiting and a lot of things, you know, sort of just the, the passive time of day, things happening. And, um, you know, I think he captures that. You know, war photography, even when you're capturing the, the death and destruction and the strife and, and whatnot that happens, you know, potentially in a conflict, um, those, are, those are brief moments in time. The rest of the time is... You know, especially if you're going there as a photojournalist, that you have to find what it is you're going to be covering. So a lot of it might be those quieter moments, those you know more storytelling moments that, again, talk and and reflect more the suffering of the situation that might be happening, or the reality of the situation, especially in, in an area that might be war torn. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, 
what else would you say about Nakwe, which is important for other people to know? People like me, they may not be familiar with his work that uh, they should see, look at. What, what makes you feel like this guy has really resonated with you and that you'd like to share with the world? Sure. So, I mean, as a, as a photojournalist, it's, you know, kind of my aspiration to be someone who can hopefully uh, create work that makes the kind of difference that his work has done. And so I think, you know, beyond just being someone, you know, he doesn't go there just to kind of, you know, look for the, the horror, you know, he's, he's doing it for a specific purpose and it's to, to shine light on a, a, a cause that he thinks is important. And so I think that's what I hope to people gain. He's not, he's not like some, you know, voyeur, right? He's not right. doing it because of some sort of sick fascination with death and destruction. He's doing it for a cause. And I think I don't want that to get lost in, you know, his work, you know, is that this, this kind of work in it. And we learned about it when we were focused on the story, when we had, you know, I don't know if you listen to Pat Brown speak, um, but he, he talked about his work covering the Rohingya crisis, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of parallels between what James is doing and what, you know, Pat is doing in terms of both covering, um, you know, this sort of area devastated by whatever conflict is going on and sort of the huge human toll that that takes on the photographer. And so it's not, it's not something that, you know, you can just do and then walk away from, you know, it's not like right. you're going to a wedding and you're going to shoot that and you're going to go be, you know, the next, you know, fine the next day. It's, it's something that takes a, a long lasting human toll on the photojournalists themselves. So, you know, know that there is, uh, a lot of not just personal work and effort that goes into creating the imagery, but a lot of a person's self that goes into um, creating this content. You know, they have to give a, a lot of themselves, and sometimes that affects them in the long run. So, you know, I'd love to talk to James personally and see how he's doing as a person because, you know, he's been doing this for so long that his mm. had to have a, a long standing toll on him. You know, just talking with a uh, Pat. Yeah, he's last 71. Week. He's been prolific for. Her. Decades, four or five decades. Now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even talking to Pat last, you know, last week, he was he, even doing just like what he's been doing, and he's been doing it for a much shorter period of time. That's had a, you know, pretty big effect on him. So, uh, you know, again, I know that the the people who do this stuff, it's it, it takes a toll on them. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because um, uh, the World Press Photo Exhibition for 2018 was at Dupont Underground. See yes, that? hey, oh, Dupont. Yeah, there you go. So uh, I'm the volunteer photographer for them. I just like to give them my time. And they host that exhibition every year. And this year they had both the winners come in. One was Amy Vitale, who always does insane photos from Africa of beautiful wildlife and tribes. But I forget the other guy's name, but he was the, the guy that was uh, at the Vegas shooting. Like he was photographing that country music festival and was there when the the guy broke through the window and just started machine gunning everybody down. Yeah. And he was literally in the back room pulling files. He said when he heard the pop pop and he grabbed his cameras cause, and he said it was instinctual, right? Like he heard it, he knew he needed to go and he went into the line of fire and started photographing it. And this guy is not a wartime photographer, right? right. Mm -hmm. He's just a photojournalist, just like any other person that loves to cover good events or works for a newspaper walks out into that, which went on for like a good 20 minutes. Yeah. And you could, the shots were of course hor horrific, but astounding in their impact. Yeah. But even more watching him um, talk about it and uh, was extremely emotional. Like you could tell this guy, he, he would never be the same. Like yeah. it, it completely altered him. Have, have you been in a wartime uh, situation where you photographed it or no? A battle situation? So, no, not to the degree that, you know, that I could, you know, talk to that um, aspect. I mean, I've been stationed overseas. I've been deployed to Iraq when I was in the Marine Corps. So, you know, it's it's uh, definitely uh, a tough situation to be over there sometimes. But it's, it's I was never in sort of that kind of conflict battle, you know, shooting and whatnot, thankfully, uh, during my time. But I know many of my friends who were. And it's, you know, it, it's uh, it's quite the experience. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of your photography. And uh, I went through your portfolio and I saw this of uh, Mr. Major General Sharpie mm -hmm. visiting. Yeah, sure. I love that shot. Oh, thank I, you. I love the guys running down the runway and the, mm -hmm. the moodiness of the clouds and the, and the light going on. So tell me uh, what was going on here. And uh, obviously, that was a series of photos that you uh, photographed. And by the way, where can people find your work again? Sure. So, I mean, you can go to DJM Photo. That's D J M 
photo at g uh, dot com. That's why. Right. Give me an email address away. That's fine. You, you can email me, djmphoto at gmail.com if you want to ask me He's a pretty questions. responsive guy. I mean, you, you can find my email address on my website. I don't, I don't really hide it. But um, yeah, djmphoto.com. That's my personal sort of portfolio and whatnot. And then a lot of my work that was done in the military, you can find on dividshub.net. That's D-V-I-D-S-H-U-B.net. Right. And folks will be able to see that in the photo too. Absolutely. And What's great about Divid's Hub, and a lot of people don't know, is that you know there's a ton of great you know photojournalists, videographers, and whatnot, um, journalists and whatnot. All, all the folks who work in the military who produce the content, this great content, um, it all goes on to Divid's Hub, and it's all free. So if you're looking for like some really cool military imagery or imagery of uh, what we're doing in the military, then go to DividsHub.net and you can get it all for free. It's all you know. Again, it's paid for by the taxpayer because you know the military is supported by the taxpayer. So it's all. It's all public domain, free mm. to use, and it, it really show like showcases and highlights all the great work being done by all of our young men and women who are you know photojournalists and videographers in the military. So I highly recommend everyone go check that out if you're looking for again good imagery. Now to talk about the image itself, so I was down in that was in Puerto Rico uh, immediately following Hurricane Maria. Mm. So you know Puerto Rico was devastated right. after Hurricane Maria. I mean. And, and Still I, is to some extent. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the scars of that hurricane aren't going any time, <laughs> aren't going any, any way anytime soon. You know, they may have like electricity now. Um, and when I got there, there was very little electricity and no electricity. But seeing you know the devastation, and destruction uh, firsthand was just eye opening. And I'd never been in a post hurricane environment that quickly soon after to kind of see that like immediately I was there, I think about two weeks after the hurricane hit. So, you know, you were seeing, you know, down trees everywhere, light poles down, you know, buildings just ravaged by the, the winds, uh, flooding in the streets. Um, it was, it was pretty intense to see all that. Uh, but I was there specifically to support the public affairs mission and, and help, uh, tell the story of, of what our, you know, military was doing in support of the relief effort. So, you know, one thing that, and again, it goes back to Major General Sharpie. So he was in charge of all the air operations that were going on in Puerto Rico. Oh, wow. And what a lot of people don't think of when they think of, you know, again, getting to this island and, and supporting them is that the only way to get any supplies, anything into country was being, was, was, was via aircraft. aircraft. Right. right. Yeah. And every single aircraft that coming in was Air Force. And the Air Force was using pretty much every single aircraft it had in its, you know, itinerary, in its capabilities to get gear and stuff over to the country. So for the first, you know, first few months of the relief effort, it had to be flown in because, again, the, you know, the ships and stuff, the ports weren't really operational. So you could get a ship to uh, Puerto Rico, but how are you going to unload it if the port isn't operational? I mean, you know, the, the stories of t- tons of things sitting at ports was true because, again, you couldn't get the stuff out, you know, because the road systems were messed up and stuff like that. So you mean, to, so again, airlift was the main means by which to get, you know, humanitarian supplies, to get people, to get equipment into the country. Mm. Um, you know, I, in fact, I, I have some photographs of the first, um, what is it, the the trucks that are used to repair the power lines. Mm-hmm. So the first couple trucks that came from the United States. Uh, I've got some coverage of them as they were coming off. Were those the ones from Montana that got in all that trouble? Yes, <laughs> yes, it was. But at the time, you know, again, being there, it was just nice yeah, to see right. again the support come in. You know, I wasn't, you know, worried about the, we, we, the background of it. You I, know? I can't, I can't help but throw in the uh, the humor there. Sorry. No, absolutely. We it, don't want to get political today. Indeed, indeed. But uh, again, being there and seeing it all happen. So Major General Sharpie, he was in charge of mm-hmm. all of that stuff. So my goal, my job down there was to essentially help him get that story out. Because again, people wanted to cover sort of the, you know, the, the aid being hand delivered to the people, which is a very important story and something that needed to be told. But again, it, it needed, all that stuff came from the Air Force. So as someone in the Air Force and trying to support the general, I was trying to make sure, make sure that story got told and, and help get him in front of the media and talking to the radio stations. And one thing that, you know, obviously there's no, there's no way to like send out newspapers and stuff like that. The internet was practically down for almost uh, most of the country. So there was barely any electricity. So radio was really the main means by which we got information out there. So sure. I would get the general in, in front of radio stations, have him do interviews with the, the folks and stuff like that and tell the story of all the great things the Air Force was doing to capture um, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, 
aspect of the mission. And that photo in particular was him doing just a site survey, of a different sort of area where some airmen were stationed at in a diff another part of the island, just kind of see how they were doing and, you know, see how they, what, what part of the mission that they were supporting. Um, so uh, it was just neat to kind of get, get to ride along with him because um, we got to go in a helicopter and I got to see That's really cool. the devastation from the were air. Were you shooting from the helicopter? I was, I was actually. The shot. shake's pretty insane, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a, <clears throat> excuse I, me. I've done that once. I, I was like amazed at it. And how bad most of my shots were. They were horrific. Yeah. yeah. You have to have a really high shutter speed and just kind of spray and pray, really. But uh, there's actually a video of that I shot uh, if you look on my Divid's Hub profile right. page, which and I'm by sure By the way, you'll folks, link. David is a videographer as well. So That's right. I, I don't discriminate. I like to do it all. And uh, I shot. Um, so one part of the a portion of the what they were trying to do mm -hmm. was prevent this dam from breaking. Right. Wow. And so because of all the flooding and stuff that had been going on and all the damage, there was a really a big fear that this dam could burst and that would be just devastating for the low lying areas around it. So the military was actually working to move um, different like uh, rubble and, and different sort of you know, kind of like what you see on the road when you see a, a division in a street, you know, that big cement piece right there. Right. So they were moving that stuff into an area to reinforce the, the lower portion of the dam to kind of prevent it from, because there was a lot of erosion. And so our helicopters were being used to move that stuff into place. Right. And at one point during our flight from uh, where we were at back to um, uh, the, the main capital of Puerto Rico, uh, we, we flew by that. So just, you know, I turn on my camera, turn it on video mode, and I was shooting them from the air as this helicopter was dropping stuff into the location so you can see the video but uh, just know that it's shaky as i'll get out because uh, again i'm trying to shoot from my seat in a moving helicopter was it open doors too what's that was it open doors no no i was shooting through a window oh. so again i was like sitting this way and the window was right here to my right I had to like move the camera and hold it like this. Oh, so you're kind of like shooting with the screen on. I got the screen that, popped out. Yeah. So I'm like trying to like, oh man. The LCD. Yeah, right. Exactly. <clears throat> so I've got the screen popped out. So I wasn't behind. I wasn't supporting it. So, um, but yeah, again, shooting on a helicopter, mm -hmm. never easy. I have done other shooting on a helicopter with more access when I was with uh, the 106 Rescue Wing on okay. uh, the Air National Guard. Um, so there, you know, I, I was on uh, what's known as HH-60. That's mm -hmm. sort of the military um a military hel helicopter that they have and uh the, yeah that was a lot more ability to shoot um not necessarily open door but at least open window mm. um and sitting in a seat and facing outward so yeah when i shot i, I did it do it open door it was in hawaii right i did the kill way thing you know where like you know, oh come on up and see the the um volcano and uh i had a 400 millimeter i had the 8400 on the nikon da10 mm -hmm. and i was shooting at like 250 to Maybe it was one four hundredth of a second, and I could yeah. and I was more afraid that the camera and the lens were going to fall right out of the out of the whole helicopter. Oh wow! And, and I was good. I was scared stupid. Like I was basically wrapping it around my the the. Um, uh, oh god, I'm so tired today. Um, excuse me, but the uh, camera strap. The camera strap. That's what we call those. Uh, I had the camera strap basically tied around my arm twice just so wow. I would not let it go. You know, it was, it was crazy. I was a little bit probably overexcited about that. But anyway, uh, it was something I would love to do again. If I don't know about you, but sometimes when I photograph something and it doesn't go the way I want it to, I'm definitely very much in for a redo. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get back to your stuff. And uh, you sent me a photo, which was your, you said your most famous photo ever, which well, is my, a, my most favorite photo. Most I have favorite. no idea what my most famous photo is. I'd have to. Yeah. You don't have the analytics. Running no, no. <laughs> this is my personally of all the shots I've ever done in my entire career. This is the one that just I, I love the most. And, and for the people that are just listening and not uh, watching, let me uh, describe the photo for you. There's a. A gentleman uh, with, a, I guess, an orange or a red, looks more red, baseball cap, in the middle of what looks like, based on my own experiences, shooting in the rain, a pretty heavy downpour, looking straight up into the rain, and a raindrop literally is caught splattering on his nose. Yeah. So, first of all, you had to have been shooting at a ludicrously high uh, frame rate, probably one one thousandth, one two thousandth in that range, somewhere like that. Am I right? 
Probably. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. Honestly, I'd have to look at the metadata myself because it's, it's been about four years since I took this photograph. Right. Um, but it definitely, yeah, it was it was probably at least 250th a right. second. It definitely wasn't a slow shutter It's hard shutter to see speed. the rain, right? But it was a slow enough shutter speed to get the motion blur of the rain as it's popping off his nose. True. For sure. So I would definitely say, because again, I was shooting this at night, and the only light in this entire scene was the one that's behind him. Wow. And a little bit of the one that is above him to behind me. Yeah, because his left side, there's some highlights on there. Right. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So, But the main light that was lighting, so what this is, was a drilling location for a well. Really? Uh, yes. So this was, uh, I was in Honduras for okay. uh, supporting an operation called New Horizons. And you haven't been to Russia recently, have you? No, no. I've never been to Russia. never been to China. Uh, actually, I'll be going to Korea here I'll be this North summer. North Korea. Yeah. Uh, South Korea. South, South Korea. Korea. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, again, this was shot while I was uh, in Honduras. I was in Honduras for three months supporting a humanitarian exercise called New Horizons, which mm. is supported by the U.S. Southern Command. Uh, so they sent me down there to cover... Um, these groups that were building a well and also building a school and also providing a so medical awesome, support. Right? Absolutely. Great mission. Awesome to be a part of it and be able to cover it for sure. So you're right. And his, his cap is red. Um, he is part of the red horse, which is a engineering group within the air force. So, mm. you know, uh, you may have heard of the Navy Seabees. Yeah. Uh, these two, you know, whether, you know, deployed areas or conflict zones or wherever, and they are the construction group that builds up the structures and, and whatnot. So they do that for the Air Force. And again, they're called Red Horse. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to cover them, as well as the Marines who were down there building a school and uh, some doctors from the Air Force who were, you know, doing, uh, again, all kinds of different surgeries in one of the local hospitals. So when, when you opened up the camera, I mean, did you know you nailed it as soon as you shot it? Or was this one of these happy accidents where you look at it and your fellows are like, no freaking way. Oh, it was definitely a happy accident. That's it was just awesome. me back. Because, again, in this specific scene, it's not rain that you see. It's actually water that's being pumped in. So the way a drill works, they have to pump in water to move the dirt out. And so in this particular instance, I think they had finished reaching the bottom of the well, but they had to pump in a certain amount of water. Again, I don't know the details behind it, but they're the ones creating this water. So it's not rain. It's actually it's so water being shot up. Holy, holy nuts. Yeah, That's it, nuts. They're <laughs> pumping water down and it's being shot up out uh, of the drill rig and falling back down. So, you know, that's, Part of the complications of shooting this is I'm shooting while getting wet. You know, my cup, my camera's getting all wet. My lenses are getting all wet. And I'm right. just trying to get these cool scenes and stuff like that and cover what was going on. So I had no idea any of this would come out, you know, until I pretty much got back. So there was, I wasn't really checking. It wasn't shipping. Yeah, you weren't checking each shot. Right? No, no. I, I didn't notice that I had gotten the shot until, again, I was at back in my room, all dried off and had everything downloaded. And I was just... Pleasantly surprised. What was it? So, what was your reaction when you saw that? I mean, usually when I have like a happy accident, so to speak, I'm like, ah, I'm like, ah, so losing it. So. Yeah, I, I was <laughs> extremely pleased. And, you know, I just felt it was like, no way. I couldn't believe it that, you know, I'd never gotten, you know, this sort of level of right place, right time, I think, to this degree. Like, you know, I've gotten right place, right time for the most part, but I kind of knew. And this, it just was. Yeah. So amazing. Made me so happy. And again, I threw it up online. I threw it on Facebook and stuff like that. And people I'll, must have been like, oh, no way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of people were, were pretty, uh, pretty impressed with what I was able to capture here. And it was just, again, the fact that the raindrop fell right on his nose. Right on his nose. And that, you know, I captured it right as the little, little sparks, water sparks, as I call them. Were, were coming off. It was just, it made me so happy. And again, I've been doing this for 20 years, right? And right. I've got tons of stuff. I've photographed all over the world, photographed all kinds of different situations. But this made me the most personally happy because again, I wasn't going for it. I wasn't, I was just trying to get a Such nice a shot. photo, man. And yeah, it was just, it really made me happy. And again, with all the different considerations that were going on with the scene, you know, the muddy ground and, you know, having to get up because he was not on the ground here. He's actually on an elevated platform. So mm. I had to get on the, I had to climb up on the side of the elevated yeah, platform. Yeah, you could see the height. Yeah. So I think for this shot specifically, I didn't have like, the, I wasn't looking through the viewfinder. I think I was actually probably arm you reaching You were just it. like banging it out. I was yeah. spraying and praying yeah. for the most part. So I think that's what added to the overall enjoyment of the fact that I was able to get this shot because again, it wasn't really planned about. It just kind of 
all came together. So yeah, it's sharp too. Really Thank you. Like yeah, that. I was I was really surprised again because I wasn't shooting at at a like a two thousandth of a second. I was probably shooting at like a two fiftieth of a second because again it was at night. So that's a good fact- tip though. Like I I shoot a lot in the rain as well, and uh, um, to get those streaks, you do need to shoot a little slower. Absolutely. I usually shoot like one one thousandth just so I get all the water drops in the mm-hmm. air. But I I've, I haven't thought to do that. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Pro tip, ladies and gentlemen, shoot at one two hundred fiftieth in the ring we're slower if you can get away with slower i mean you know uh, probably if it had been even slower than that it would have made those droplets even more pronounced you know you, you kind of need that at night right with the light going on oh yeah i mean it was just a, a, a nature of being in there there's another shot that i didn't include and that i'm also very proud of and uh, happy with i was actually on a i was shooting the pararescue jumpers when i was at the air national guard mm-hmm. and they were doing a water rescue exercise so they're over the water they're they're throwing their ladder down to the the, the sea right. to, to rescue someone and um i'm shooting it from a boat so i'm shooting it from a boat that's moving with a long lens with a long lens which more shake <laughs> right. not great absolutely and the helicopter is is moving and awesome. doing things Throwing and i'm getting hit you. with sea spray because i'm that close to it and I'm shooting it at a low enough shutter speed to where I can get motion blur on the blades because, you know, if you're shooting helicopters, right, you want to get a little motion blur right. on the blades. And I still got some decent shots that were in focus and also sharp from that. So I'm, I'm pretty proud. Maybe I'll send that photograph to you if you'd like to feature it. But All right, yeah, send it along. We'll put it in there. So those of you that are watching it will probably see it while we're discussing it. So yes, indeed. Go. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, let, let's talk one more shot, um, and this is one that where you did some video as well, and mm-hmm. people can find that on your site. But uh, sure. the recent Naval Academy graduation in Annapolis is that right? Uh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. So I got the opportunity to photograph uh, the graduation ceremony of class in twenty nineteen U.S. Naval Academy graduates, and it was an awesome opportunity. I've not photographed that before i've never been to any academy graduation it's really kind of cool with the sea of white and mm-hmm. the leading line up to the sea of white with oh, the uh, graduating cadets and everything it's amazing yeah so this particular shot here is actually right after once the event starts all the graduates come down this uh walkway come down the stairs and, and walk towards where they're going to be sitting so this is the beginning of the I procession th- three yeah. hour long graduation ceremony but yeah the initial procession so that's actually the first two folks in that line are the first two folks, you know, in that in that group that are coming down. So mm-hmm. uh, it, was a, it was a really neat event. I shot it with a photo and video. I actually shot a lot of slow motion video. I don't know if I had a chance to check out the video, but that's kind of like one of the things I try to do, differentiate myself, because, you know, there, there's a lot of different media out there, a lot of different people doing photo and video, and I'm trying to find new ways to cover things. And what I love about the GH5 is you can shoot 180 frames per second. Wow. So I definitely take advantage of that and try and incorporate that. So it gives it almost like a dreamy sort of look to it. Um, so I was shooting mostly 180 frames per second and a little bit of 4K. So yeah, the, the video product is is on the um, I went around the lens.com website so you can see some of the photos and obviously this. And then of course I got a, the the key shot where they're throwing all the hats up in the air. That was kind of like you know the 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 key shot you want. And that and also the Blue Angels flying over. I tried to get that shot, but I shot that on video. But Again, trying to balance between the two, it, it's not easy, you know. And How many th- bodies are you carrying when you shoot an event like that? A total of one. Yeah, okay, so that is really tough. Yeah. It is, yeah, because I'm switching between back and forth. The hardest part is switching between 4K 60 and 1080p 180. So if you're shooting video, how many cards are you ripping through on I only got two cards with me. I really? got two 64 gigabyte cards, there you go. and I've got my computer there. So half about when they were doing all the sort of reading the names and people were getting their certificates, which takes the longest part of time. I'm just downloading, you know. So I think I did, uh, I think close to 150 gigabytes worth of content nice. you know, from this one event. So yeah, um, yeah. makes sense. But I have had, like, and now you can get, like, 512 gigabyte cards and stuff like that. Or they're probably by this time, they'll have one terabyte cards. But I love the dual card slots in the GH5 because you can, again, get either double your storage or you can get backup. Yeah, I, I, I can't. Two shoot. card slots. What a concept, huh? I can't shoot without it. Yeah, shame on you, Nikon. And Canon. <laughs> What were these guys thinking? I actually, uh, we were talking beforehand about gear. Actually, let's skip that. I don't want to talk about gear on this podcast. That's okay. kind of the reason why I started that podcast. And actually, that's a good segue to your most recent podcast, which was episode 178 of Around Indeed. the Lens. Yeah, yeah, and you guys were, the, I guess, it was it Rick that started the podcast? Uh, somebody had started a podcast because they were sick of people talking about gear. I forgot where it was. Uh, where was that I you? I think that was Ibernex. So okay. Ibernex, when he started back, 
like 13 years ago. He's the grandfather of this whole, right. you know, photo podcasting world. And when he started, the only podcast he could find were ones that talked about gear, which is still dominant. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I'd say there's more variety now. I think there's more like education based and, and right. more like uh, interview based, similar to this. So he started in the career field or you know the podcasting world. And it was mostly gear type. So he wanted something where he could actually talk to photo journalists about their work. And so he's our photographer. You know, he, he does all the different types of uh, people who do – anyone who picks up a camera pretty much and has made a name for themselves are on his show. And, again, like I was, I was lucky enough to be on his show. But, uh, again, he talked about you know, his personal experience doing the podcasting. But well, you know, the difference between my show and, and sort of any other show, your show or, or Iber and X show, is you know, we, don't, we don't focus on sort of the individual person. So, right. You know, we'll talk a little bit about Ibernex and, and Rick Majewski, who was also on the show, a little bit about their background. Yeah, Wasn't Rick the guy that had like some sort of like a horrible incident where he got scammed right out of the gate or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I've also fun. been scammed. It's not fun. I know. I've, I've, I've had, a, you know, those photo shelter kind of people coming in like, hey, we'd love you to do a model shoot. Yeah. Oh, we can't get you the advance in time. Oh, my oh, gosh. God. It's like, go away, man. <laughs> it is it is a dangerous world out there. And you got to be very careful about who you agree to do what for. So, sure. many, so many people are trying to take advantage of photographers there are a lot of people that aspire to be epic right they mm want to be that nat geo photographer and there are a lot of people who take advantage of you for that absolutely so uh, you know rick and ibernex great guests and what again like so we do the show is a panel show so it's a roundtable panel discussion so i'd say it's most equivalent to what you would see at a a photo conference where you have a panel Mm -hmm. of, of people discussing a certain topic but we don't focus on one topic we talk about whatever's in the news that week so again it may be general topics like what's your favorite camera or more related to like how do we deal with this specific visual journalism aspect and so i think for this show you know we talked about how uh photo journalists or freelancers i should say get paid right. and how cnn is trying to implement this net 90 thing where it's like you have to wait 90 days from the point where you produce the work or content for CNN to actually see a paycheck, mm. which is really tough for a I freelancer. Know. You I know? know, I just got, I have a client like that. It's just the way it is. And it's, it's, it's just not fair to, you know, like what other organization or what other profession would it be appropriate for you to wait 90 days? Like, hey, um, I'd love to buy that computer. Can I pay you in 90 days? That's, well, plus it's like, it's not like AT&T doesn't have money. Right, the the parent company has money. Oh yeah, these are multi billion dollar corporations. They could afford to pay quicker than ninety days. A hundred dollars, you know? or two hundred dollars, or five hundred dollars, or one thousand. If somebody's a really good pro, I mean, come on, yeah, absolutely. Man. It's it's just, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to claim it's corporate greed, but you know, I think it's it's based sure it on is. they're 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 financing their bankroll on you. Yeah, it's tough. And it's tough for freelancers. I don't know how. You know, they would do it. I mean, again, if you want to get started in freelancing nowadays, you should have, you need to have probably at least six months to a year worth of runway. Yeah, yeah. Um, But again, we we have great conversations like that. Uh, It's myself and usually my three co-hosts, Zach Roberts, Travis Keyes, and Ron Hamilton. Uh, They're on the show with me almost every week. Uh, One, you know, some combination of them. And again, like I said, it's a panel discussion. I did not want to have me and one other person to do an interview. Not that I don't love the interview format, but it's like... Right, right. This is your gig, man. Yeah, you know, something different. You know, I'm trying to find some way to kind of broaden the overall spectrum. You know, there's a ton of great interview podcasts. Yours is one of them. Uh, But let's do something different. Let's just talk about, you know... To be determined, man. We're on episode seven here. Hey... Or is it this one, eight? This is eight. So far, so good. So far, you're doing a great job so far, even at this early stage. And Again, a lot of great interview shows out there. So let's do something different. Let's just talk about what's going on in the world, you know? Right. Because these are people, you know, again, I try and have people on the show who are subject matter experts who have done, you know, done the craft and, you know, can hopefully comment on what they see as sort of what's going on in our career. Sure. And now you're on episode 178. So you've been doing this now for how many years? Four years now? A little over three and a half years. Almost four years. I'd say three and three quarter years by now. We started. Because I'm sure you take a week off now and then, right? We take two weeks off a year, so there's two episodes, one Christmas and New Year's, where I don't do a show. Although I do do, I still do a show, I just don't do a show with guests. Okay. Um, I do a sort of year in review episode where I'll take and listen to every show that I listened to in the past year and try and pick out little bits and pieces that I thought were interesting to the viewer. So if you're listening to this show and you think like, oh man, I might be interested in Around the Lens, and you, you're not sure if you are, I would highly recommend checking out one of our year in review special edition shows because that gives you just a really smorgasbord potpourri of the different type of guests we have and the different topics we have. Mm. So that that's kind of like a what I tell new listeners is kind of listen to that. It's a good primer. If you like that, then yeah, 
subscribe to the show. See if you like it on a regular basis. No, it's really good. I, again, I enjoyed listening to it, preparing for it, and I thought it was enjoyable. It's definitely stuff that uh, I love podcasts for commuting and also for while I'm working. I'm not a person that really does well with a single channel, so right. to speak, mm-hmm. of uh, only doing the work. I need some background stuff, and I, I really enjoyed it. It Thank was you. really good. I'm glad, so, glad to hear that. Uh, people can check out the episode on iTunes, aroundthelens.com, and where else? Sure. So, I mean, we're on Google Play, we're on Stitcher, we're on everywhere, you know, any any podcatcher you choose. Uh, I, I use Podcast Addict on my phone, and yeah. it searches for it just fine. But, yeah, obviously, you know, we're on the big ones, you know, uh, iTunes and Google Play. You can also go to our website, aroundthelens.com. You can find links to all of our shows, in addition to all of our social media and our Patreon page. So, if you want to give us a you know, throw us a little a few bones our way. We, we'd love to appreciate that. We produce a lot of content besides just the podcast. Um, you know, uh, specifically, we do interviews with uh, different photojournalists and different people in the career field. Uh, we do reviews of camera equipment. We do unboxings. We do a lot of content uh, separate from the podcast. And all that content gets put on our Patreon page first. So if you'd like. Yes. And by the way, I have a Patreon page, too, if you guys want to support my work. Yeah. Here. Yeah, man. Spread People the don't realize how uh, how much effort goes into these things. Yes. No, absolutely. I mean, you, we all deserve, I think, to be compensated for our work, and you know, ultimately, it's a it's a craft. It's a it's a it's what we do for love. Um, and so, but if you can, you know, give me, give uh, any of us, you know, who are doing this. I mean, Ivor Next also says we we all have, it's like we all have a podcast, we all have a Patreon page, you know. Yeah. But um, how, well, like let's discuss that a little bit, sure. not the Patreon part of it, but how much work goes into each episode for you. I mean, like, do you putting in like <clears throat> probably three, four, five, maybe even hours on an episode, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, a lot of things going on behind the scenes. I'd say that the hardest part is really just finding guests for being on the show. And, and I think that's true of any podcast that sure. has guests. It's like, there's a lot of footwork that has to go in there. A lot of interaction and whatnot, emailing, calling, phone calling. I mean, just doing this show right here, right now, you know, it requires me to drive an hour. You probably have to drive right. from wherever you're at. And I'm paying the hard cast guys to, to do it for me because exactly. I've, I've, this is my fourth podcast and I wanted higher production quality this time, you know, no, just absolutely. haven't done it in enough times. So yeah, I say production quality is one of the most difficult pieces, at least with my show, because it's all Skype based. So I'm talking right. to people and they're over all the over the country, right? Oh yeah. we got people in Hawaii. we got people mm-hmm. in New York. I mean, sometimes we have people from, you know, different time zones overseas in Europe, Australia. I think we had somebody before this episode who was in Afghanistan. So, you know, again, <laughs> trying to balance out those different time zones, plus trying to balance out the internet issues that happen sure. plus you know having people who are you know again i'm not interviewing people in a, in a podcast studio with professional mics and, and gear these are usually photojournalists who have maybe a lot of phones right. maybe maybe so you know i'm dealing with the the quality of their microphone the yeah, quality of their webcam outs and things like that yeah. Uh, yeah we had somebody even on that last episode you know they were uh, you know they were they were trying to be as courteous as possible but you know there was background noise around them and that all affects the overall production of the show sure but I would say I would put in, uh, uh, gosh, uh, you know, I've, I've streamlined the process, thankfully. But I would say overall, it's about four to five hours per yeah. episode in terms of my free time having to kind of put sort of the background to include also the creation of the episode and the post-production. Sure, yeah. So I'd say there's there's about four to five hours, not to mention it's just the, really the constant grind of trying to get people on the show, you know, interacting with folks, going to events like Focus on the Story, meeting great sure. people like yourself. Yep. I and, was booking people yesterday for like a good 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. And I'm throwing stuff into it, right, because I'm at DuPont Underground, so I got a couple people that are... Uh, there'll be you'll see next month but long story short i mean there are substantial people so i had to throw a bone in there so i'm like hey we'll go to dupont underground afterwards and explore the tunnels and do mm-hmm. some urbex they're like oh yeah let's go and, yeah you know so but i had to throw it in there i felt like and, and i think what makes it easier for for your show and other pre-recorded shows is like again you're doing this you may spend a day doing four interviews or however you you know, do it and then you can kind of release those out over weeks I do my show live right. every week on the same time, no in the excuses. same place. Right. So it's like I have to make sure the guests are in place at that time, and we do it. And when we do it, we're doing it live. So on live is great for you know a couple reasons. It allows guests to interact with you know um, us people watching to interact with the guests. It it just and it saves a lot of post production time on me because as soon as we're done with the show, it is what it is. Yeah, I don't. I barely edit. And actually, I wanted to ask you, kind of, you've been in the podcast game since I think two thousand nine, right? Is that yeah, what you yeah, said? Yeah, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. What are your thoughts on? Editing a podcast for us and ums and other things like that, you know, especially with a pre-recorded show. I just did that recently for one of my episodes, one of my interviews, and it is so time-consuming and laborious. But 
Do you think it, it makes a difference? No, I, I actually think, and I don't think we do that here. I think when we do the post-production, we're putting the photos in and adding right. the intro and the outro and usually just cutting up the video so that there's stuff that we could post on Instagram and Facebook. Absolutely. Uh, but generally speaking, I kind of, I would prefer if people, if they're going to curse at it, you know, if they say shit, that shit's in there. Right. Or... I do that a lot too, as I'm kind of thinking while I'm talking, which is never a good thing to do, by the way. But generally speaking, that's the way people talk. And the more authentic and raw the show is, it's usually yeah. good. Like today, our sound engineer is Nick, but uh, uh, usually Panama does the show. And Panama sometimes interacts in the show. Mm -hmm. I, I would just rather people feel like we're having a real conversation. And part of that is actually having people go, I'm an O, like they normally would. Right. So, so with that, Ladies and gentlemen, you can find David around aroundthelens.com and support your podcasters. Yes. All right. Yeah, support this show as well. Thank Throw some bones over to show me. What's your what's your well you'll probably put on your stuff, but showmepodcast.com. That's right. Throw some bones over. Thanks for listening to the Show Me Podcast with Jeff Livingston. More shows, sponsorship, and donation information are available at showmepodcast.com.